We've got the new data, folks. We've got the new data, and what it shows is this. It is quite clear. There is gonna be a conservative renaissance, folks. There is gonna be a conservative renaissance, and the reason for that is conservative people are breeding. We are breeding more than liberals. We are gonna outbreed them, folks. You are not gonna wanna miss this. Um, now, the problem with what I like to call the um, Dutton Turney thesis is that it argues, in essence, um, that conservatives are outbreeding liberals and um, there is a heritability to political viewpoint. So um, we just have to sit back and wait um, for the conservatives to um, outbreed the Liberals. And my problem with that is that it doesn't take into account the importance of power. It doesn't take into account um, the way um, that a small minority can control a majority if that minority um, is organised. And so that is my problem um, with the dutton Turley thesis. Hello, 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 and welcome to this edition of the Jolly Heretic. <coughs> now, today I'd like to do something a little bit unusual, and that is I'd like to respond to a video which has been made about my own research by Academic Agent. Now, I'd like to emphasise that I like Academic Agent. I met him in London when I was there a few weeks ago. He was generally a, he was a good chap. Uh, he was an interesting guy, intelligent guy, and... Um, I've been on his show a number of times and he's been on my show, so you know, no problems there. I simply disagree with his analysis of my view. I don't think he's got my view quite right. Actually, I think he's right. He's broadly correct. And I think that really what he's criticising is the Turley model. It's the Turley model that he is, it makes sense to him and is clear. And it is not my model. Now, the essence of what AA noted in his video, which I put a link to, uh, is this. Basically, the Dutton Turley model is that right wing people, conservative people, are, are outbreeding left uh, liberal people. Uh, conservative people, the heritability of pro uh, political viewpoint is reasonably high. And so, really, we just have to sit back and wait, and eventually, conservatives will outbreed liberals. He pointed out, rightly, in my view, that the problem with this is that a fanatical minority that is highly organised can control uh, a majority and can push things their way. And there is a great deal of evidence that this is correct because the majority is conservative, but they are not organised. They, they, they can be picked off one by one by a fanatical minority. And so that means that the left will be able to remain in control of the majority. And he points out correctly, in my view, that this is consistent with the way in which everything has moved leftwards continuously over the last 50 years or so, despite or 60 years or so, despite the fact that the majority have fairly conservative opinions. Now, uh, my issue with Turley's uh, viewpoint, and uh, he, he's done a lot of good work and a lot of interesting stuff, but is I think it's too rosy. It's too positive. Um, he basically, it is Turley that argues According to the data, conservatives are outbreeding liberals, and so there's going to be a new conservative renaissance, and we just have to sit and wait for this to happen. I think this is, uh, and it is true, by the way, and AA didn't look at this, but it is true that people that are, uh, uh, we tend to become more conservative with age, uh, and, and people that are young at the moment are not as conservative as they should be. It's not as liberal as they should be. They, they, they should be very, very liberal. They're not quite as liberal at, for their age as they should be. Uh, but nevertheless, what he's arguing is that we all become more conservative due to these breeding patterns. I think the problem with this is that Turley doesn't distinguish between two distinct kinds of conservatism. The first is the conservatism of the, the fundamentalists. These people are highly organised. These people are, are, go to church. These people are, are, have clear views. These people have dogmas. These people live according to their principles and whatever. These, are, in many ways, are the conservative equivalent of the liberal, woke, power-hungry fanatics. There's those kinds of conservatives. Um, and then there's just people that are just, just reactively conservative. People that are reactively conservative tend to have 
low intelligence. Uh, why? Well, because we live in a liberal society and being intelligent is associated with working out what the dominant set of values is, with having the effortful control <clears throat> to force yourself to believe that dominant set of values and then signalling to the extent to which you believe them in order to attain power and in order to attain status. People that are less intelligent are less able to do this. They're less able to understand what the dominant value set is. Uh, they don't have the effortful control to force themselves to believe it. And so they tend to be, in our context, more conservative. People that are conservative tend to be low in trust and therefore they don't particularly like change or anything new. They tend to, uh, people that are low IQ, sorry, they're low in trust, they don't like change, anything new. They, they therefore tend to be conservative. Uh, people that are low in IQ, uh, tend to be low in openness, so they don't like anything new, uh, anything that, that, that they're not used to, uh, they tend to be black and white in their thinking. Now, these kinds of people are therefore conservative. They won't necessarily live according to conservative principles. Exactly these kinds of people are having illegitimate children, are having numerous children by numerous unsuitable partners, are committing crime, uh, 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 whatever. Um, but, but, the, but these people are conservative as well. You've got to distinguish between the two. And we do distinguish between the two, myself and our squire, uh, Oliver Rayner Hills, J.O.A. Rayner Hills, the squire, uh, we distinguish between the two in our forthcoming book, um, <clears throat> The Past is a Future Country, The Coming Conservative Demographic Revolution, which is available, will be available in July and is available already for pre-order. And this is what we find. So this is my argument. And, and in this sense, I am much more... Uh, of the same view as AA than I am of the same view as Turley. We argue the following. There is a change, according to the demographic data that we have analysed, there is a change gradually occurring in the nature of the elite due to these breeding patterns. Forget society as a whole, that doesn't matter really, it, within certain limitations. In the nature of the smart fraction. So, if you look specifically at the high IQ quadrant, there is a strong relationship between fertility and conservatism. So, in the the high uh, the heritability is as high as 0.7 of fundamentalism and conservatism, and in the high IQ quadrant, it is the conservatives that are substantially doing the breeding. Conversely, in the high IQ quadrant, the liberals are tending not to have any children at all. So what that means is that across time, the high IQ quadrant, i.e. the elite, the people that are going to run things, because it is intelligence which is massively central to being part of the elite, to getting into the elite, to staying in the elite, to controlling the elite, the uh, high IQ quadrant will become more conservative. Secondly, once you look at those conservatives in the high IQ quadrant, among them, it is conservatism that predicts fertility among fundamentalists. Why does this happen? Well, because... <clears throat> In the same way that once you're a part of a left-wing group, you signal for status within that left-wing group. And one of the ways you signal for status is by saying, oh, well, I'm so committed to the cause that I'm not going to have children. One of the ways that you will show commitment that you genuinely believe in God and you genuinely believe God is looking after you and you genuinely believe in the Bible or whatever is that you just have loads of children because you indicate that God is blessing you. So there is a correlation between conservatism and fertility among, within conservative groups. And when I say conservative groups, I can't stress enough, I'm not talking about reactive conservatives, like, like the low IQ conservatives, Brexit voting, whatever. I'm talking about people who um, go to church, who are part of organised communities, who are the conservative equivalent of the liberal activists, the kind of people who in England 20 years ago got together and managed to get Jerry Springer the opera, which they considered to be blasphemous, shut down and sent into financial ruin. Highly organised, fanatical, fundamentalist Christian conservatives. So that's the second thing. The third thing, as I said, is the lib among the elite quadrant, it is the liberals that are dying out. Liberals, as you go down the IQ scale, liberals have 
more children. So the liberal who is of IQ of 110 or something, who's a school teacher, they may be having, and who, who you have on their Facebook page at the moment, they'll have a Ukrainian flag, and before that they had a... <coughs> I don't know, a Black Lives Matter flag, and before that they had a Refugees Welcome flag, and before that they had a Pray for Paris flag, and so on and so on. You know, the kind of NPC meme, I support the current thing. That kind of person may have one or two children, but the people that are at the top, the high IQ elite liberals, they are not having children. So what this inevitably means is that there would have to be, over the next 10 or 20 years, a percolation upwards into elite institutions of basically Nick Fuentes types, of high IQ, fundamentalist, organised, uh, 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 you know, conserv cooperative conservatives that weren't going to take any nonsense. Now, there are a number of ways that would be opposed, of course, uh, oh, and obviously it will be. So first of all, you would expect the Liberals in the positions of power to shut down the organs of power. That could be one thing they could do. They could stop them getting into these organs of power by shutting down the universities. But they're not going to do that because the universities are the way that they have power and the universities are the means by which they indoctrinate the future generation with their views. And The universities are the thing that seem to currently have some kind of prestige and people that are Machiavellian, they love prestige. So they're not going to do that. The second thing that they will do is exclude those kinds of people from the universities, which is they've already started. So the universities cease to be an organisation that you get into because you're highly intelligent. That becomes far less important than you being ideologically sound. But the problem with that is that among those who are, it is those that are ideologically sound that are, that are not breeding. So intelligent people who are liberal are not breeding. So the result of that is that you have to appoint people to the institutions who aren't very intelligent. And you're already seeing that with some of the outrageous things that people that are obviously appointed for politically correct reasons uh, get away with saying in institutions like, you know, Oxford and Cambridge. You know, the, 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 the economics professor that just all she's ever done really is go publicly and take her clothes off. That kind of thing. So, so the, the, the result of that is that the institutions become increasingly stupid. If they become increasingly stupid, they lose prestige. And if they lose prestige, then what will happen is you will have rival institutions that will be created and they will be, that prestige will pass to those institutions. And so uh, uh, gradually, therefore, to maintain financial um, uh, solvency, these kinds of institutions will have to change and let in the up-and-coming uh, conservative elite. Now, if you think that can't happen, if you think, oh, that... <coughs> that's impossible. If you have this essentialist view that it is essentialist to the nature of Oxford and Cambridge, that they are elite, let me take you back in time to the mid-19th century or the early 19th century. That simply wasn't the case. Um, to go to Oxford, Cambridge or Durham, you had to be Church of England and you had to be conservative, like practising strict Church of England as well. Um, lots of intelligent people were not Church of England and they were excluded because people that are, are highly intelligent, are very, very intelligent, like outlier intelligent, will tend to question things and be nonconformist. Outlier, because they're a bit autistic and weird and obsessed with the truth. And so those people had other institutions that they said that they went to. The Scottish universities, Oxford, Cambridge, Aberdeen and uh, um, Glasgow, and Harriet Watt. Um, and then, of, of course, the University College London and these kinds of places that weren't, really, weren't Church of England in their orientation. And what happened eventually was that Oxford and Cambridge went into decline and they were considered finishing schools for the sort of, you know, the, the sort of not very bright members of the upper class. Um, the highly intelligent people and the way of fitting them into reason, you know, jobs in the church and things like that. The highly intelligent people would go to the Scottish universities and would go to the University of London or would go to university abroad in Leiden or Germany or somewhere like that because those were the places that looked at science. Those were the places that weren't religiously bound. Those were the places that weren't dogmatic. Those were the places that produced important results that, that actually, you know, actually assisted things and made things better. Charles Darwin clever as he was, originally went to Edinburgh. He didn't go to Cambridge. He was far too clever to go to Cambridge. He went to Edinburgh, but he was too lazy at Edinburgh. He was too obsessed with his, with his, uh, with his science and whatever. He wouldn't focus on the course, which was a medicine. And so he was booted out and he had to go to Cambridge to do theology. So this has happened before. And what happened was Oxford and Cambridge were in decline. And eventually it was either go bust because you have no prestige or you reform, which they did. And then you let in... Uh, <coughs> 
what was the left wing, because we're in a conservative society at this point, so you let in the, the, the high IQ people who are going to be left wing and liberal and, and critiquing the, the current dispensation, you let those people in and you reform and you become more truth focused. And the result of that was that prestige passed back to Oxford and Cambridge and Oxford and whatever, and these places became highly prestigious once again. And all that's happened is that this has gone through a cycle, the priestly cycle of universities, we might call it, where it becomes prestigious, it attracts, therefore, Machiavellian types that want power but don't, don't believe in truth. Um, it, we flip over to an to a, a, a individualistic, individualistic ideology, that takes over, and then it just happens all over again. So, one way or another, you would expect, because the elite is becoming more conservative over time, the, uh, the uh, percolation upwards into elite posi positions of these conservative people. And once you get to about 20% of a, of, a of a group that are the new dispensation, they are seen as the up-and-coming people. Experiments have shown this, and we tend to flip over. We tend to flip over uh, <coughs> into the new way of thinking very quickly, and you get a kind of revolution. Now, it could be argued that the people on the left won't let this happen in political terms. They will hold on till the last man. Uh, fine. Uh, so what you would have to get would be some kind of revolution. And if you think that that's naive, if you think, oh, that couldn't happen, well, it's happened before. Uh, it could be a bloodless revolution uh, like the 60s or, uh, um, I don't know, what happened at the end of the Soviet Union. Or it could be less than, uh, you know, not, a not bloodless revolution. But that would be the kind of thing that would inevitably happen. Uh, also, if they, uh, they then get another issue, which is the increasing student stupidity of who they have to promote. Um, they'd have to promote very stupid people into positions of power in this context for them to stay liberal, and those people then would make bad decisions and whatever, and you would... Um and due to the focus on harm, equality, harm avoidance and equality, you just get all these bad people making bad decisions. Eventually, you get chaos. And the result of that, inevitably, would be a right-wing backlash. People, people's level of dysphoria and unhappiness and so on would be so high. And they would notice that other people felt the same way. And eventually, you would get somebody in, in a position of authority, like the Yeltsin type, who would notice what was going on um, and would lead a right-wing backlash. And a right-wing backlash would duly occur. Um, it is inevitable in the data, but the point is that it is, it's the elite, it's the nature of the elite that matters, not the nature of the people. Within reason, that's not important. The second thing we have to look at, and we look at in the book, is the changes in the nature of the left. Now, <coughs> the left have obviously been extremely successful over the last 50 or 60 years in taking power. There has been a march through the institutions of the left. They have been Machiavellian. They are more intelligent than people on the right because, of course, there was a flip over in the 60s to left-wing values. And then, of course, you, you start to get uh, runaway individualism, runaway left-wingism. It attracts intelligent people, the midwit intelligent types, not the uh, high IQ intelligent types, but the midwit intelligent types. And so you get these highly intelligent, highly organised, fanatical people, and they take power. But the problem is this is this is changing. Because the data indicates it is changing and it will change because it is the most intelligent members of the left that don't have any children at all. So what is the coalition of the left? It is basically middle class white people, sexual minorities, uh, they don't have children, um, and ethnic minorities. The middle class white people, they're not having children. The middle class white leftists, they're not having children. And the result of that is that the, you would expect the intelligence of the people that are left wing to be going down. And I think this is quite clear in the quality of people in my generation that are leading members of the Labour Party. I mean, Angela Rayner. I don't really think I need to say any more. If you're American, I don't know who Angela Rayner is. Google her, put her into YouTube. Angela Rayner, she is the deputy leader of the Labour Party. One doesn't really need to say any more than that. Um, the second thing is that the coalition is very unstable because as the left moves in this continuous runaway individualism direction where first of all it's uh, women's rights, ethnic minority rights, eventually you get to things like gay rights and transsexual rights and all this kind of stuff and the problem with that is that that is that a lot of people who are in, in the coalition who are Muslim uh, or who are Hindu, uh, they're extremely conservative, they're socially conservative and they don't like this kind of stuff. And this creates a tension within the left. So the left, the, the left, the white left is becoming stupider and stupider and stupider and less and less effective. And the coalition is breaking up because the ethnic minorities are, high in, are highly conservative and they don't like this kind of stuff. And so eventually what you would end up with is a situation where it would come apart. 
and you would basically get no middle, no white left wing people at all. Um, uh, they, they would go the way of the dodo, the dinosaurs. You would simply get ethnic minorities um, who would, we could be expected to be you know, nationalistic for Pakistan or for wherever they come from. Um, and you would get BLM type, basically. Um, and you would get these conservative fundamentalist uh, uh, European types. So, so this is, this is uh, the nature of the left as well, means that they will become less Machiavellian, they will become less good at holding power, they will become less united at exactly the same time that the, that the conservative European types will become more good at holding power, will become more Machiavellian and will become more united. Um, this will lead, um, uh, leave very intelligent black people, very intelligent Indians, very intelligent uh, Muslims, whatever, in a very difficult situation. They'll have to decide what to do. They'll have to, uh, either they will align with the left, which will be increasingly ethnic minority and low IQ whites perhaps, or they will align with uh, the, the whites. They will white, the, the conservative whites, they will white align. And you would expect the more intelligent of them in their own economic and social interests as, as well as uh, yeah, to, to, to white align. So you'll get a split uh, along those lines as well. <clears throat> and by the way, then eventually, when things flip over, you will get runaway conservatism uh, among the elite. And the result of that will be that it will be actually, ironically, low IQ white people that will be more liberal because they're always behind the times. So they will be the ones that are liberal. It will be low IQ white people, therefore, that will be involved in the left even more so. Um, and it will be high IQ white people involved in the right, rather like in Victorian England. It will be kind of like what we saw in uh, Victorian England in that way, that the concerns about liberalism and liberal morality or whatever were concerns among the lower, for the lower classes from the higher classes. Now, we also should stress, this is another way in which I, I disagree with Turley. Turley talks about a renaissance, a conservative renaissance. No, 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 no. Our book demonstrates this is all going to happen in a context of general decline. There is a negative correlation between IQ and intelligence. We have lost, we lost 15 IQ points between 1880 and uh, uh, 90, uh, uh, the year 2000, which is the difference between, a, I don't know, a, a policeman and a high school science teacher, or between a high school science teacher and a, a university professor of science. So um, on every measure, I've looked at this in many videos and uh, in, in my book, At Our Wits End, Why We're Becoming Less Intelligent and What It Means for the Future. And also I look at it again in my new book, Sent Before Their Time, uh, a genius... Um, the uh, charisma and big born prematurely, um, we are becoming less intelligent. It's going to lead to the collapse of society. Why? Well, because as you become less intelligent, things don't work properly. Uh, social trust collapses as you become less intelligent. Um, and therefore, the result is that society balkanizes, society breaks up. And what you would expect to happen is that the more intelligent people, which is going to be the conservative people, would, uh, would the fundamentalist, conservative, organised people will escape from that society, from that chaos, and will set up little neo-Byzantiums in which civilization potentially kind of holds out or at least declines more slowly, uh, wh whereas around them there will just be low IQ chaos and hell. Um, and that, that's what you would expect to occur. And remember that in England, it is only those with an IQ of about 85 or below and who have criminal records, the criminal underclass, only those among the native population have above replacement fertility. So you would, you would see an escape from, the, from, the, from this, from this chaos, a, a balkanisation of the country, a balkanisation of everywhere, and an escape into refugia of civilization on the part of these high IQ a conservative fundamentalist and white aligned uh, high IQ people. That's what we would prognosticate. Uh, that's the, 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 the our most optimistic prognostication uh, would would occur. So um, that I think is a very different view and much less of a of a white pill than the Turley model. There is no Dutton Turley model. There is a Turley model and then there is quite separately a Dutton Rainer Hills model. And I hope I have set out that for you quite clearly. And if you want to know it in more detail, then I suggest you pre-order our book, <clears throat> The Past is a Future Country, The Coming Conservative Demographic Revolution, which will be out in July. And I hope this bit of interest. And if it has, please subscribe. It really helps if you do that. Uh, you can see ways to support the show below. Remember, I live show Mondays and Thursdays at 7pm UK time, 2pm New York. And get out!